All right, I'm on. Yeah, yeah. They're, on uh, they're on page two. <laughs> okay, good. Hang on. <laughs> I, have this. I can see them on page two. There's, you know, uh, I don't see any questions on mine. Yeah. Well, they haven't actually started writing them yet because they, oh, okay. they have to do it now. So let uh, every if I may start, let everybody keep uh, keep uh, your microphones muted, and if you do have a question, do write it in the do write it in the chat box. Uh, uh, we have I, I have asked Daniel and Alice to actually to just go on with with what they were beginning to express because it's a wealth of information and I'd love to hear more. But it's up to them. If they see a question that they like, uh, they're happy to respond to it. When you address a question, please uh, write to whom you're addressing. So whether that be Ellis or Daniel, please, that would be great. So, uh, so please mute your microphones so there's no interference. And uh, Sorry. Okay, let me just grab one. Um, I hear. Um, uh, hi, guys. Ellis, can you repeat the vectors you mentioned, please? Also, does the choice of wrist techniques in Aikido have an esoteric meaning, or they simply relate to the sword? So, the second part of that question, um, they don't relate to either the sword or have an esoteric meaning. Uh, there's the, 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 when, when Ueshiba talked about Aikido as a manifestation of the sword, uh, yes, the um, Aikido through Daitoryu is almost surely related to Onahai Toryu, and there's some superficial elements, but they're on the level of body organization. So when O Sensei talked about a sword, he always talked about Tsurugi, which is the old two sided, not a katana, it's the old Chinese sword which is a rich, in Japanese iconography, is a ritual sword. So what he's really talking about is forging yourself. You become a sword, a, a, a folded, tempered being. You know, and, and again, I could take that a lot of places. Um, but so that's the issue of it related to the sword. As far as um, the five vectors, uh, so the easy way to think of it is look at Ikkyo through Gokyo. And Ikkyo is a movement that goes on a, this vertical circular axis. Nikyo goes on a spiraling horizontal axis. Sankyo goes in a spiraling up axis. Yonkyo, right, I'm sorry if I, yeah, Yonkyo is a spiraling down axis. You see the same thing in the entry movement, Kaitenage. And Gokyo, which is sort of like Ikkyo reverse, really comes to a point, and that's a pure wedging idemi just like, for example, a Joe thrust, okay? So those are the five vectors um, in, in brief. Uh, they are not internal training, they are movements. You can, you can do them with internal training, now you're becoming a sword. You're, you're, you're folding yourself and tempering yourself, so the movements have a particular way of using your body. Okay, so that was in brief. So Dan, if you see a question for you, why don't you take one? I'm trying to get all these questions are. Let's see. Everything something pops up sometime. I don't know. Chat seven. Oh, there they are right there. Okay. I didn't have it open. Uh, uh, it was enough standalone system. Do you think cross training is a good? Okay. Uh, hi, Dan. Did you ever feel that I feel was enough to a standalone system? Do you think cross training is a good idea? Uh, yeah, I think any kind of training is good. I mean, there. I've often thought that I wish I could go back in time and train in everything. You know, I mean, recently Sistema, you know, I really liked the way that uh, in Sistema, how the, the softness in the body and how they move, that they accept and receive everything. And I think there's a real, they have a, some ways a better understanding of the body than we do in IQ because they're actually having contact all the time, actually feeling the punches, touching each other, uh, feeling the knife against your shoulder. I remember once, uh, 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 Tong Sensei, I don't know if you know him or not, Tong Wen, uh, him and I shared a class and he was uh, showing me uh, uh, defense against the bayonet. It was a dull bayonet, but he stuck it right into my stomach there and he says, how would you deal with this Aikido? And so I tried the Tenkan and he stuck it in my gut and I tried to move and he stuck it in my gut. I couldn't get away from the knife. And he said, now, he says, just completely relax and don't worry about it. Just let, completely let go and let your body decide what it wants to do. And I 
breathe, uh, breathe, uh, uh, breathed out and relaxed. And as he pushed in, the muscle tissue and skin got out of the way. It didn't want to be poked, so it got out of the way, which is a really weird feeling. And that was something that he had learned training his system. And, and I started thinking about, you know, there's so much that the body can learn. You know, we try to sort of uh, uh, control things with our brain all the time, micromanage everything we do. But the body itself has its own way of dealing with things. Uh, for example, when a horse fly lands on a horse's flank, right, and uh, the horse's flank will shudder. Now he's not thinking, horse fly on flank, okay, muscle shudder. The muscles shudder by themselves because they don't want to be bitten. And uh, I think this connection to, you know, the body and allowing it to make a lot of its decisions on its own is important. So cross training and, and a lot of these things is important. So the more the merrier, I think. I just wish I could live a thousand years and train in everything. So there's a question here. These days with the rise of MMA, there's a lot of focus on martial effectiveness. A lot of people saying oh, Aikido is just not effective. What are your thoughts on the value of Aikido today? So let's start with this. Um, the arts that I first trained in were arts for barbaric aid. Uh, they had been refined. Uh, Kodyu is refined, it's mannered in some ways, although um, the Araki that I do is, eliminates, eliminates most of that refinement. It's pretty, pretty uh, barbaric in a sense. But for me, Aikido, modern Aikido, is for me the martial art for the gray areas of civilization. and almost, you know, I'm 68 years old. Uh, because of my profession, I've been in some dangerous situations, but I have almost, I've been fortunate, I've almost never been in a situation where I've even seen a weapon, and I've never had to be in combat as an adult. So, and, and I've chosen a profession where I go to dangerous places. So the point I'm making is, for most people in modern society, we don't live in barbarism. And Aikido in particular offers a, a, a physical metaphor for what I call the gray areas, where people are in conflict, where there is a possibility of resolution. The whole Aikido metaphor that you throw somebody, they roll out of it, or they tap out of it, or whatever, is a lot like real life. Now, um, if there was no concern for martial effectiveness, then we would do, be doing something like Shin Taido. And I don't know if anybody's ever seen Shin Taido. It's mm -hmm. insipid. Uh, when, when you, if you're doing something that's allegedly martial and it has no martial virtue, it's sappy. Um, it gets this kind of woo-woo spirituality. And I've dealt, I've been in Aikido dojos where they train like that too. So if you will, the two edges of the tsudugi, the sword that's got two edges, the one edge has got to be the, 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 the life-giving sword, conflict resolution, all that. But the other, is, it's got to have martial virtue. Now, does that mean that you have to be able to break, uh, go down to your local MMA club and, 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 and beat up all the competitors? No, you could do MMA too, right? Cross training, go back to that. But Aikido has got to have, in my view, to be good Aikido, martial virtue, so you know what you could do and choose not to do. That's the gray area. I could solve this by breaking this person's arm, but I have the ability both to do that and to turn away from it. But if I am just a pacifist who couldn't not be a pacifist, I don't think we're doing Aikido. Okay. So, Dan, you grab a question. Okay. <laughs> uh, let's see. It says here, 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 here. Okay. Uh, okay. Let's see. The question here is about uh, that train with Ikeda and teaches internals. And Ellis mentions his own internal spring training. Internals have been a source of much discussion over the year. What's your personal take on this and where it fits around Aikido? Uh, you know, I haven't done anything special about internal training. I mean, the times that I've been with Ikeda Sensei, I mean, when I first trained with him, it was back in the 80s, and he hadn't really started this. He was just starting to delve into it. Uh, but I have attended some of his seminars, and I found it very interesting. Uh, what I find, though, is that 
for example, a lot of times with internal training, you can become very stable and people can push on you and it's hard to move you. And uh, I find I can do that without any internal training at all, just be, have being aware of myself. In other words, having a, a body consciousness. And if I'm conscious of my whole body, if I have this sort of uh, embodied consciousness, no matter where you push on me, it all goes, it distributes this energy all through the body. But I don't have any particular area that I'm working on, like the tanden, or I'm doing this, or twisting this, or spiraling this. It's just being there alone is the, you know, just my presence alone is the stability. So my internal training would be more like, uh, I would say, embodied consciousness, in the sense that I'm aware of my finger as much as I am my whole body at the same time. Everything is conscious. I have this entire body consciousness, my legs, my body, my torso, my head. And I've worked on this a lot. But it's not particular to any one area or any particular type of method that I do with this. It's just that my training alone has brought me to a sense of I know where my body is. I know where my skin is. I know where my, everything in my body is. And it's all conscious at the same time. And that is able to manifest quite a bit of power and also absorb quite a bit of power. So I don't think I've done anything special in my training like that, but I believe that all this internal training, what it really does is it gets you to focus inside. So if you're thinking, let's say, if you're sort of focusing on some things in your belly area and you're saying, okay, I feel this and I feel that, you're actually starting to embody. Your certain embodiment needs to be aware of the body, to be conscious of the body. And uh, that any method that gets you there works. It's not like just, there's no particular school that works any better than the other, as long as you're, you have that. Now, for example, animals are, have a natural embodied consciousness. If you ever play with a dog or something, the way they move, the way they turn when you touch them and stuff like that, they don't think about it. Their body moves the way it needs to move. So they don't, they've had no internal training, and yet they have this incredible ability to move in a very spontaneous way. Uh, I think humans sometimes complicate things, you know. So I'm going to... I see a couple of questions I can answer quick. And so I'm going to take a, a, a few of them real quick. For Ellis, you mentioned keeping the art you practice separate in your mind. Do you still find a benefit from taking concepts one, one art to another? And if so, how do you keep that benefit rather than turning it into a mess? <laughs> when I, well, this is like music. One of the worst things I ever heard musically was in this wonderful American show called Piano Jazz where Marion McParkland, a wonderful jazz pianist, would have other jazz pianists come on, they'd talk about their jazz, and then they'd play duets. And this one woman jazz pianist had spent her whole life feeling inadequate because she couldn't read music. She was brilliant, but she couldn't read music. And so she decided to learn classical music. And so McParkland said, well, could you play one of your new pieces? And so what she did is she um, was playing jazz, stride piano, and all of a sudden she started playing passages from Chopin. And it was like, oh, this is, and it was pretty good, but it was so terrible. They just <laughs> didn't fit together. It was a chimera, you know, a body of a, a goat and the head of a lion. So <laughs> when I train, I believe I can only get information from each art, keeping them separate. Now, my, influence i may choose like for example arakio i have the authority to do this i've changed the arakio i learned from my teacher right but i still keep the core operating system of arakio i put new apps in it so to speak but i try to keep them separate now when i'm ever in a so to speak a freestyle situation free play rolling whatever it all mixes together i don't think about it right but i'm much better for differentiation the philosopher Emmanuel Levinas said that um, differentiation is the mother of consciousness. So otherwise it does become a mess. Um, there was another question I want to take on real quick, which was, uh, um, actually there were two. What about Nikkyo and Shihonage's defenses against the ska being grabbed and indeed Yonkyo for seizing the wrist of the swordsman? I think that's in response to my statement that the wrist techniques have no esoteric value. They may have practical value. Esoteric would be, is there a symbolic reason for a particular choice of a shihonage or whatever. I'm not impressed with all that because these were standard jujitsu techniques back 400 years, right? And so I think what O Sensei did is he picked those techniques because those particular techniques fit his training goals. And I would go too far afield right now, 
but I think he picked those specific techniques because taking ukemi for those techniques develops your body in particular ways, which would be the Aiki body. Okay. Again, that could be a whole hour or two right there. But just think about that. The, what O-sensei did with the techniques he chose was as much for the benefit of uke. And we make a mistake in our Aikido that uke is at the service of nage who's doing Aikido. If ukemi is 50% of Aikido, then there's got to be more to it than taking falls. Ukemi receiving the information becomes your training device. And I think O-sensei was very conscious of that with the techniques he chose. Okay, there is a question here. It said, did O-sensei say, not say that he, Aikido is the art of the sword without the sword? And uh, I like to just put in my own, uh, you know, I'm not a master of uh, weapons. I mean, I include in part of my practice and stuff like that. But I have these, uh, found there's a relationship between my body and the weapon differently than I thought it originally, although I, you know, when it was taught to me, that somehow we have to become one with the sword or we have to think of the tip of the sword and project things out that way. And I guess uh, this is a little bit off the story, but everybody, all of you have seen Yojimbo, right? And, uh, you know, with that sword, Mifune is like a killing machine, you know? 20 guys around, no problem. He just takes them out. And then when they take his sword away, he's a punk. That always upset me. <laughs> you know, why when they took his sword away was he a punk? I mean, it shouldn't change anything. The way he moved his body uh, was just was, was the force behind the sword. And uh, I often heard a story, and this may be, again, one of these stories that, that people tell about a, a Kindle master who was coming home from the office one day, and uh, he was attacked by a bunch of guys, and they were beating the crap out of him. And all of a sudden, he pulled a pencil or a pen out of his pocket, got into the pose, and he just wailed on these guys because he was back in form again. He had that pen there. So to bring this into what I'm talking about is that if you're standing in with a Vulcan in your hand or a sword in your hand, and suddenly it gets knocked out of your grip and you feel helpless, like, oh my God, where's my sword? And you start running for it and, and charging after the sword. You, you really don't understand the relationship between your body and the sword. Uh, when I hold anything in my hand, it doesn't have to be a weapon, I am probably 99% conscious of my hand and feeling my hand. I'm not feeling the grip of the, of the wood in my hand. I'm feeling my hand because it's free to do what it needs to do. If I bend my wrist, the Vulcan goes this way. If I bend it this way, it goes that way. If I raise my arms, it goes this way. Whatever I do to my body, the sword follows. That's where the unity comes in. Not that I'm trying to unify with the sword, become the Vulcan. The Vulcan is itself. And when I, when I am conscious of my own body and holding something, that becomes part of my body. But through my body, not through my mind going to the sword. See, the problem is we always try to go with our mind, you know, sort of like doing, uh, uh, those of you who've done the kokyo, uh, the kokyo go with uh, the way Toy would describe, you know, imagine there's a mountain 20 miles away and you're going to move it. That's the mind doing that. But if you're in your own body, if you're sitting on the edge of the Grand Canyon or standing on the edge of the Grand Canyon and you're reaching out to the other side, if you're not careful, you're gonna fall out. But if you, are standing there and you're conscious of where you are, then you can look at the other side or reach out to it. But you have to start with honing in on where you are and where your body is and not separate the mind and the body. So the, when we work with weapons, yes, they become, they should be, you know, weapon and body together, but if they're not there, it doesn't change anything. So I think maybe that's what Sensei meant, meant that it makes a difference if you have a sword or not. You are the weapon and that whatever's in your hand is sort of an extension of that. So let's see, Gabor asked the question, um, there's a lot of discussion online about Aikido losing popularity, but is that a bad thing? Arakido must have fewer practitioners, for example. That's true. <laughs> there's, there's probably, in my line of Arakido, I've got less than 10 students. Uh, and that's all I personally want, because uh, there's, there's a very particular level of excellence that I'm looking for, and I have to have people who want that same excellence. But, you know, for whatever reason, Aikido, the people who do Aikido chose something else, uh, be it post-war, and maybe it was all Bino, that they're saying, how are we going to survive post-war? Let's commercialize this thing so we can feed our families. I actually respect that. But let's say it was more than that. And I think that Doshu, Shomaru Ueshiba, 
has not been given nearly enough credit because he wasn't a shamanistic holy man like his father and he was kind of quiet and all of that. And people say, I wasn't half the man his father was and he bureaucratized the whole martial art. You know, in terms of who had a more profound effect on society in a beneficial way, I'd go with Kishomaru. Because what he did is he took an art that was for a very few, that was associated for the most part with far right people who gave us World War II. Uh, uh, and that's, oh, since I never changed. I could go, go in a long dissertation on that, but he never changed to the day he died in terms of that. But, but Shimada developed a training that welcomed everybody. And you could become as excellent as you choose to be. You can, you can do eight hours a day. You can become a, a technical living masterpiece, or you can do this a couple times a week. And, 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 but what has happened is with all the availability of all these different martial arts, people can say, so what's unique about Aikido? And you do see dojos that are almost completely middle-aged and older people. So Josh Gold of Aikido Journal is doing a wonderful project right now. And I'm sort of consulting with him on it. So I really feel honored to be part of it. Um, and what he's trying to do is develop Aikido as training for leadership for young people. And we're developing a pilot project right now. Uh, and the first pilot project will happen. And kids are signing up for all over the country from all socioeconomic groups kids who want to be in the military, kids who want to be community organizers. And the idea is what they see in Aikido, they're not even sure what it is, but they see something in the movement that resonates with them, not in the level of I'm going to be able to kick somebody's ass and I'm able to protect myself when I walk down the street, although that might be part of it. But this is going to teach me how to be an effective leader and deal with conflict. And I think that if, you know, I think what Josh is creating uh, uh, with the help of some other people is possibly the future of Aikido and particularly bringing young people in. <clears throat> okay, there's a question here. Anything you would like to share or recommend about your personal practice regime, especially in the current lockdown situation where partner practice on the mat may not be an option for most of us? Uh, I'll tell you what I'm doing, and I mentioned this in the last uh, get together we had on Zoom, is I've taken a vacation from Aikido. In fact, taking a vacation from all martial arts. Because sometimes you need to step back from all this, you know, and just say, okay, what else is going on in life, you know? And I'm spending time with my family, I'm going for walks with my dog. I'm, uh, we're getting ready for a big move coming up, so if I show you the house right now, everything's getting packed up in boxes. And except for this conversation here online, the thoughts of Aikido and anything about Aikido hasn't come up at all. It's really nice to sort of forget about it. I remember when a good friend of mine and from DC, Peter uh, Trimmer, quit Aikido, you know, and I was really upset. I said, Peter, how can you quit? How can you quit Aikido? You know, you're, you're one of the good ones and you know, everybody likes your teaching and stuff like that. He says, yeah, you know, I just decided I not want to do it anymore. He says, you know, my knees have never felt any, any better. They just feel great. And, but it really upset me that he could do that. But, you know, I'm not saying I'm quitting, but taking vacations, it's nice sometimes. Just forget about, you know, over and over again, the whole Aikido concept. This is a time when you can sit back and do other things. You're not going to lose anything. You're not going to get behind. You're not going to, I mean, get out of shape, sure. I mean, you may not be able to take a roll as well as you did before. But if you want to train, fine. If you don't want to, that's fine, too. You don't always have to be training your whole life. Sometimes it's good to take a break. <laughs> And I'm on the other side. <laughs> I, uh, it, I'm going to do a little pan. This room for about a month is where I was living because I almost, I, I never, I, I've been now tested twice, but it was well after my illness was bad. Um, I almost surely had a pretty bad case of COVID-19. And uh, so I was holed up in this room mostly. And um, uh, whatever I had, I'm not quite finished with it. My lungs have been affected. Mm -hmm. So oh, wow. I can't do heavy aerobic demand, but I can do, I can breathe deeply. That's the paradox. I can breathe deeply. Mm -hmm. uh, I can't breathe fast. And so I have a personal training regimen that I spread out through a day, which actually is two hours. Mm -hmm. uh, I do different 
you can call qigong sets. I do something called baduanjin, which anybody who trained with Tamara Sensei, he absorbed a, a, a one line of that. I do another set it's called snake turtle qigong, which you, you're as supple as a snake and live as long as a turtle. And I sometimes get it confused and I'm as supple as a turtle. And, um, anyway, <laughs> um, and then I have various uh, solo training exercises, uh, which are specifically for martial training, uh, one called spear shaking. Uh, I do something with uh, 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 sumo teppi, uh, where you, I've got a standing tree that I, I, I'm hitting. So I'm, I'm actually very busy. I'm doing a lot of training. <laughs> Uh, despite, you know, the uh, injuries I walk around with or all the years I've been training, I'm finding workarounds for that. And I'm actually getting better and stronger. Uh, I'm, I'm enjoying the hell out of it. And I sort of regret, I first was introduced to effective solo training when I was in my 20s in Japan with a teacher named Wang Shuqin, who was known as the chubby chucker. And... Uh, <laughs> He was about five foot six, maybe 280 pounds. And um, he, there's a story online, which Chiba Sensei told it one way, which isn't the true story. Uh, basically, Terry Dobson was studying with Wong and the Uchide, other Uchideshi at Hombu were giving him a raft of grief. You know, why are you betraying O Sensei? So the first thing he did um, was uh, he went to uh, uh, Ueshima and said, do you mind? And Ueshima said, I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> and so they kept giving him grief. And so finally, Terry said, well, come with me. So him, Terry Dobson, uh, him, uh, uh, Don Drager, and Tamara Saltome and Chiba went to visit uh, Wang. He took one look at Chiba and he said, come here, kid. And um, he said, he was famous for, go ahead and hit me. And so Chiba punches him in the stomach and Wang just sort of laughs at him. And, uh, um, uh, he tried two more times, and on the third time, he turned away and then tried to sucker punch him. And what Wong had the ability to do was suck in your punch in his belly and then push it back out. And Terry said it almost dislocated uh, Chiba's shoulder. Chiba loses his temper, grabs Wong's hand, and tries to break his wrist with a kodagaishi. What Terry told me, and Sawatome Sensei collaborated, was Wong reversed that dropped Chiba to the ground and had him screaming. Now, Chiba tells a story differently. You can find that online. But I had two eyewitnesses, actually three, because Drager told me the same thing. So I trained a little bit with Wong. When, right before he died, he had melanoma. Uh, he was very old. And what we trained, it was in winter at this Kodinji, this small little uh, temple. And there was a group of people, and you walk up and Wong was always there first. And you see him doing these kind of little stirring movements with his hand. And I'd be waiting around thinking, okay, when are we going to start the Tai Chi? And uh, so then people would come, we'd go through the Tai Chi form. And I'm going, man, I'm not going to get strong doing this. I'm not going to learn what Wong's doing. And I didn't realize that he had a set of eight movements, different movements where he's doing very specific things with his nervous system as he did them. He did those four hours a day. And had I had the discipline, which no 20 year old does, but to actually say, just go up to him and say, would you teach me what you're doing before class? I could have got a 40 year advance on this wonderful stuff that he, he was doing. Mm. But I've discovered it in my old age and it's given me a new lease on life. If, if I hadn't discovered these methods of training, uh, my, the peak of my martial arts career skill would have been in my late forties. And although parts of my body are breaking down, I'm truly getting better now. Still have time here? Let's stay. We have 10 minutes. Okay, so there's a, a question here about uh, for both of us. Why do you think Kaishawa does not use more in Aikido demos? Well, I have my own uh, theory about Kaishawa. But first of all, I believe that all Aikido is Kaishawa. So. You know, one of the paradoxes I find is that for a lot of people, Aikido is applied technique. You know, you have a someone attacks and you have this technique and you apply it to them. And then the uke has the ability to either resist that technique or go into kaishiwaza. And that's not the way that I look at my own training. For me, 
the first encounter that I have with the person, I'm already the UK because I don't know what they're going to do. You know, they're going to attack in some way. And if I decide I'm going to, okay, this person's going to punch, and I'm going to do a, you know, an e kill or an e kill. I'm already setting up this, this, you know, thing in my head. And if they don't do it exactly like I've been trained, it's not going to work. You can't walk up to somebody and put an EQ on them. It doesn't work. I mean, in DC, some guy, uh, I guess, was outside the dojo and uh, uh, some drunk guy or crazy guy, and one of the students walked out, and this guy just started beating the crap out of him. And uh, a girl was leaving at the same time, and she tried to stop it, and the guy punched her right in the face. She ran the dojo with her nose bleeding, and all these guys ran out of the dojo. This is it. This is the moment of truth, right? And they're all trying to put techniques on this guy, and he's kicking and punching and just wailing on their asses. I think finally Jim and Sortino grabbed the guy's head and kneed him to the chin and knocked him out. And then somebody, when the guy was knocked out, someone ran up and put an EQ pin on him and says, I've got him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they should have put that on video. <laughs> well, that's the story I heard. I wasn't there. But uh, <laughs> see, this is the problem. I mean, how do you, I mean, LSU private examples of this working with people. You can't go up and put something on somebody. It's just really hard, you know, because the person is at this, especially the drunk, because they're like really wailing in all the different directions. But, uh, so how, do, how does this come? How does this all start? So the very beginning, when someone is engaging you, if you have, if you start off with an, an uke frame of mind, you're receiving whatever they're doing. And then Kaisha Waza comes out of that. Whatever they're doing, you receive it. And then Kaisha Waza comes out of that. So they're applying the technique in a sense. They're applying the attacking technique. You receive it as the uke, which I mean, how do you resist an uke? You ever say, oh, this guy's resisting me. You can't resist an uke because an uke does whatever you want him to do in a sense, you know. So if you engage the person, you take the ukemi, and if you have a real good sense of your own body and you follow that flow and then you go into kaishawasa, then the technique comes out of it, a natural manifestation of the technique. And in fact, to me, the perfect kaishawasa is a perfect uke. If you're such a good uke, you're so good at being an uke that you're always in tune with what's going on and you're doing it perfectly balanced if the even the uh nage if there's any flaws in their what they're doing if they have a, a desire to do a technique to you they will become the uke there'll be a natural reversal you don't have to reverse it just be perfectly centered perfectly balanced be a perfect uke taking perfect ukemi and kaishawaza will naturally manifest so all all Aikido is Kaishiwaza. All techniques are Kaishiwaza. So I'm I'm gonna first I'm gonna agree with you, and I'm gonna take it down a level mundane. And why is it not more often used in Aikido demos? One of the flaws of the legacy of Aikido is narcissism. Going back to O Sensei, sure. uh, got a cadre of narcissists em emulating narcissists. And so what happens is when people uh, 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 do demo they want to be the demonstrator. They want to be the one who, uh, um, uh, uh, look at the wonderful technique I'm doing. And for a teacher to do a demo where his student counters him and that goes back and forth, for a lot of people, they can't tolerate that. And I think this is some, uh, it's a, a toxic legacy in Aikido because it's limited that development of a kind of reciprocal practice where people can be each other's ukemi uke and nage at the same time uh so that's my two cents on that there's another question here that i just want to address ellis you mentioned that women were not often suited at aikido aikido is re recommended for all why is that well first of all i did have i've had two women students in the course of my career one has the heart of a lion she was wonderful she got injured very badly uh and the other person just wasn't suited there I think the easiest, so it's not that I've excluded women. It's just I found very few who want to do it or, or, or it, it suits them. There are other factions of Araki. There are women there. I'm aware of that. Now, the larger issue is it's like the military. Um, there's not very many people who are suited for um, Navy SEALs, Delta Force. There's very few people who have the physical ability, the will, the willingness, and all of that. And among them, there are very, 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 very few women who have the physical ability to do that with all those other components. I think two women recently passed uh, Army Ranger uh, at the very bottom threshold, right? 
So there's certain things that it's just a fact of biology that certain people and psychologists, certain people are suited for or not. 99% uh, of the military uh, options, men and women do equal from what I understand. Whereas infantry, just carrying the backpack, you need a certain amount of bone and structure and muscle. Aikido was at one time a sectarian activity done by very few and it was very limited. Uh, now it's developed to have a big tent. And so there is that intention that people of all walks of life, there's a place for you in Aikido. And so I think it's just, uh, you know, you, you could say, um, why is it that some music could, is, is liked by a lot of people and other music's really esoteric? Uh, esoteric in the sense that very few people like it. It's the same kind of thing. It's just what's been crafted, how many people are drawn to it. Great, thank you. We, uh, we're running short of time, three minutes left to go. If you want to be in contact with Alice or Daniel afterwards, uh, we, we, we're going to make this recording uh, available. Uh, we're going to make it available online and uh, so you can watch back or we can uh, share it with other people that have the uh, ability to be here now. Um, so, so there's just a few minutes left. So I'm going to let the, the last words ca uh, come from Alice and Daniel. But uh, thank you all for coming. And uh, hopefully we'll see if we can do this again another time. Thanks a lot. Um, so thank you very much, everybody. Uh, good to meet you all at a distance, at least. I'm very happy to meet Dan. Uh, I'm going to really quickly answer one question. What internal system would you recommend to complement Aikido, given this part of Aikido's little talk? Well, the issue is it's got to be part of Aikido for those people who are interested. Um, and it's beyond you know, what I, I, I could talk. I don't recommend specific people. I have my own regimen. Uh, but the real issue is trying to bring it back to your Aikido because whatever training system you have, it's like putting an engine in a car. Aikido is a specific car. And so it's going to be different from doing it through Tai Chi or something like that. Okay. Yeah. And uh, thank you everyone again for coming and sharing this. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Bjorn and Robert for putting together. Ellis, in particular, I'd like to thank you, and I really admire the fact that you put your training into the real world. You're out there doing things, your job, the things you do. I mean, that's amazing. I mean, not many people do that, including me. I practice Aikido, but I'm not out there involving myself in things like conflict resolution. Okay. And I just want to say I really admire the fact that you do something like that. Thank you. Okay. Great. Uh, let's all hope, so thanks to Bjorn for organizing, and let's all hope that we can actually physically beat um, next year. So yes, I yes. would yeah. love it. That would be great. Great. Right. Thank you, guys. Thank all you. Right. We're going to shut Thanks. this down on us, but uh, you can keep on talking. <laughs> you can <laughs> open you. your microphones. Open your microphones. Thank you. Thank you. Don't Thank swear. You. Thank Thanks you. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank, Thank you, guys. Thank you. And Thank Alice, you. And Alice and Daniel, if you want to go back on our private chat, then we can just wrap things up and say thank you. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thanks, Dan. Thank you. Thank you for coming, everyone. Brilliant. Love Thank it you. to see you guys. Nice to see you, Sue. <laughs> <laughs> the last minute is very long. Yeah. Just... All right. I'm just hanging here saying goodbye to people. Oh. It's cool. Andrew, how are you? Oh, you're muted, Andrew. Andrew's been doing Aikido for 55 years.